yeah, tell me your story. I mean, how'd you get into real estate? What really got you started with the investment side of real estate? Sure. Yeah. So actually my path into real estate, it's kind of interesting. Um, like most people know, and you know, is my family was in it. So kind of saw that from a very early age, but I was kind of a weird kid where I was like very interested in it at a weird age, at a young age. So yeah. my dad's been in real estate since I was born and you know, most kids, you know, in that situation, just that's what their dad does. For me, I kind of saw he and he was very into real estate investing from an early age as well. So I kind of saw like him buying stuff. My jobs on the weekend was going to mow his properties, go to weed his properties, uh, that kind of stuff. Always at a property, always dealing with rentals, going to get coin money from the laundry. So I kind of nice. grew up in that world. Yeah. Good and job, dad. It, it, yeah. Right. And so it was like probably middle schoolish range where I started realizing like, hey, this is incredibly smart. And I'm seeing what it's providing for a family like mm. that interests me, like being able to buy something, put in the upfront um, effort and then like down the line, hopefully see that and reap the benefits of it. Right. So yeah. I got very interested. So I started asking more questions going on. And um, when I graduated high school, actually, that was my senior project was a house flip with my dad. So I just That's wanted to so go cool. through the, yeah, so that was my senior project, right? was a house flip. So oh, I just man. wanted to see what it was like. Every from... kid do that. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of, it was pretty We need fun. more house yeah, flip so like, internships. Yeah. And it was like everything from buying it at auction, which doesn't happen very much anymore. But like back then it was much more, it, this was 2008. So, <laughs> you know, right in the crux of it all. Oh, right. Um, so I got to see everything from you know, buying at auction all the way to finishing the project and selling it and kind of just seeing that whole process, which was really cool. Um, and then when I graduated, I actually didn't want to be a real estate agent, which I am now, funny enough. I only got my real estate license when I was 18 because I wanted to be a real estate investor. And I was like, well, hmm. to learn this business and to learn real estate in general, I feel like getting my license might just help me be in that world. Um, and so that kind of took its own little turn as well. But from the very beginning, I've been solely focused on real estate investing and uh, really putting most of my time, effort and, you know, education into that space. And it's, it's done pretty well because now I can also teach people that side of things as well. Yeah. And I do it myself personally. So, yeah, that's awesome. Thinking back, what do you think was like the most eye opening thing about that senior project? Like, was there one thing that stood out to you that was like <laughs> super cool or how, did you already have the bug at that point? I already had the bug, like classic story of reading Rich Dad Poor Dad when I was like 13, 14 and like oh, that gosh. opening my eyes, you know, it's very classic that way. I'd be like, but come on, back more then, people need that education. Had, come on. Back that's then, so not good. very many people had read that book. So now you say it in like every single person that's ever heard of real estate has read that book most likely. Sure, back then sure. it wasn't as popular, but it got my mind going. Um, project wise, it was just so interesting because it was 2008. So everything was kind of crashing, you read all the headlines. Mm -hmm. Um, I did a project on that as well, of like what kind of the collapse, how that started. Um, so it, it was kind of just a weird time. No, nobody was really doing house flips then and, right. um, kind of seeing all the, all that you put into it and seeing how much you kind of made at the end was pretty eye opening as well. Cause it was really not very much money. Even today, it wouldn't have been very much money that we made, um, but at least made a, some small profit, which was kind of cool to see. Um, right. For all the effort and money you put into it, I don't know if it was, I would say, worth it. Yeah. But yeah. just seeing that and, and honestly learning the uh, workings of the auction was pretty fun as well. Yeah, and just totally. kind of knowing that side of things. So a lot of people don't uh, really look into that kind of stuff. And yeah. so going into that at an early age was pretty cool, too. Do you think that you had the long-term mindset or do you think that, did you see the long-term wealth building potential at a young age or was it really like, Hey, this is something that's really interesting and you can, you can make money doing this. Did you have sure. the long-term mindset too of like, Hey, if I hold on to this, you know, was that instilled in you the long-term wealth building piece of it? So, yeah, that's always been kind of my main focus. I've been, you know, very focused on, I, I want to be able to set myself up for future discin. I, I don't focus on current discin nearly as much. Um, yeah. You know, back then, you know, should I have just held every single project I've ever done? Yes. Uh, at that moment, was it realistic? No, because you also have to make some money and you can't right. push everything right. aside and defer every 
bit of uh, money that you can make. So, and just financing wise and everything, it's just not viable to keep on to every project that you do. But I've been very always focused on future. <laughs> I think my thermostat friend. just fell off the wall. <laughs> Jeez, landlords. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, that's awesome. Well, okay. That's a good transition. Awesome. And that's probably a good tip too. I mean, what would you say? So to someone who's brand new to investing, what's like maybe the number one or two things that you would really impart to someone who's thinking about it, maybe new to it, wanting to get into real estate investing? Yeah. So I got some good ones on that. Um, first would be, you kind of just have to know your strategy would be the biggest one. So, you know, there is a million, if you go into bigger pockets, which is the biggest investing website out there, right. you're mm -hmm. going to see a hundred different uh, ways you can go about real estate investing. Right. And yeah. that's not to say it's every one of them is going to be for you. So you really have to, you got to kind of plan it out. It's not, it, a, it's not a rich, get, get rich quick scheme, anything like that. It's yes. a very slow builder yes. for wealth. Uh, so that's the biggest thing is if you're trying to get into this just to make a dollar really quick, it's it's not going to be for you. Um, but the biggest thing is to kind of have what you want your life to look like. Basically, are you a are you a wholesaler? Are you a fix and flip kind of person? Mm. Do you like getting your hands dirty like that? Um, are you more of a buy and hold? Does that make sense if you have a W two and you can support your normal life? And you don't need to make a ton of money, but you're looking for your future. Maybe buy and holds make sense for you. Um, right. Not everybody has that option. So I think the biggest thing is kind of having a plan going into it and sticking to that plan. I think a lot of people in this industry can get kind of sidetracked when they get into it. Like, oh, I want to be a real estate investor. Let's do this. Okay, I'm going to do a fix and flip. They get, you know, kind of go down that road. Then they read an article. Oh, this is the next biggest thing in real sure. estate. You got to do wholesaling forget fix and flips okay now i'm a wholesaler i'm going over here and then you just spend all this time kind of getting a little bit of information on each thing and never really focusing on one and then you're sure. gonna never end up doing anything it's kind of just you're gonna look at every deal then you're gonna switch to the newest yeah. and best thing you're not gonna so build, I think the biggest thing yeah you're not gonna build that skill set that you need to actually be successful right, right. In, in, in right. your area so. of focus yeah and that's not to say if you're let's say wholesale or fix and flip again uh, if you're planning on doing a fix and flip, you should have options where if that doesn't sell, you have a, a plan B because not every mm -hmm. project's going to sell right away. You might have money under that. So you do have to kind of set yourself up for other options in case that needs to come up. But in general, you should have a plan and kind of stick to that for a little bit. Um, yeah. And then maybe down the line, you realize that's not your skill set. And so you transition from there. But sure. I think people just kind of bounce around too much or just uh, analyze every deal to death and never going right. to actually do anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. You see something is not working and you feel like it's your, your sign to try something else when really that's the hard lesson you probably need to learn. Right. And most lessons right. are learned right. in failure. So sticking with right. it and learning through failure, failing up as they say. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And that's, that's not great. to say just do a deal to do it and lose a bunch of money from it just for a lesson. I think there's better ways to go about it as well, but <laughs> there's less expensive so lessons kinda, to be learned. Exactly. Yeah. You got to yeah. kind of take both as well. I think you kind of touched on my other question a little bit in there, but maybe uh, if you've got one, you can highlight what do you, what do you see as a common mistake new investors make, or maybe what's a, what's a story or, or an area or an experience that you had that just maybe didn't go so well? I'm kind of that person where I, if I don't have enough information, I just don't do anything. And so, especially early on, I was like, I'm going to know every single thing inside and out. So I think that's a big thing people can do. Um, I think some people can jump mm -hmm. in a little too fast and just go with it. Um, so like some of the big mistakes you see people make are not really understanding financing. So, um, let's say you're using a hard money lender or a regular lender or a private money lender and not really understanding the terms of those, that financing. I think it's sure. really important to know how your money is being used. And if you're using other people's money, you have to make that sure that they're okay as well. And you're not just wasting away their money. Um, so I think that's one of the big things you can run into with mistakes is not understanding the financing side of things. I think you really need to know that inside and out to be a good investor, in my opinion. 
Yeah. Um, and people can just run into issues with that. And then the biggest one I already kind of touched on is I think just not having a clear plan going into a deal. Um, it wasn't me, but I have seen an investor that, you know, they're halfway through a remodel and they're like, you know what, I'm actually going to use this as a buy and hold instead of a fix and flip. But it just didn't, the amount of money they put into the rehab was all mm. set up for that final finishes and not set up as like rental finishes or thinking about what a rental right. needs or commands. Um, is this even going to do well as a rental? Is it in the right location for a rental? Is the lot right for the rental? Uh, you don't typically want a house on an acre um, as a rental because you're going to have to <laughs> maintain an acre of right. land. So right. I've seen I have seen that plenty of times where someone gets into it and, and switches their what they're planning on doing. It just makes no sense for that project, and you know you never ran the numbers for that when originally buying it or anything. So yeah, I think that's one of the big ones for sure. Yeah, ask the right questions, and that's so good. I mean, so true with the financing piece too, because that is hard to fix when you're right in the middle of it. Because that was mm -hmm. probably the same answer. <clears throat> the same answer at the beginning is going to be the same answer in the middle of like, Hey, that's not going to work. So now right. you're stuck right. holding the bag for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. And that's right. not necessarily a place you want to be. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Expensive lessons. Nobody likes those. <laughs> Go. Right. Any, uh, any more stories from any fix and flips? There, yeah, there's been, there's been lots. I always try to tell people when doing a fix and flip, it's, it's a, for not, not for the pain of heart. I mean, it, you're going to run into surprises. You should be putting 20% minimum extra into your budget. Mm. Um, and I think that's one of the big things actually as a mistake people make is they just don't know prices of things. They're just uh, oh, maybe sure. guessing or they're going off of maybe what they read on bigger pockets, but that's a, that's someone doing a fix and flip in Missouri or whatever, you know, it might be Alabama and right. prices are 30 grand for a property. different here. Exactly. Prices are drastically different here and prices is everything. Uh, labor is more expensive here. Everything is more expensive here. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll see some wholesalers or something putting up like, oh, you can buy it for 300000 put 25000 into it, and it's worth four fifty. And you look at that originally, and you're like, oh, my God, that's amazing margins. And then you really dive in. You're like, oh, no, it's going to take probably seventy grand actually to fix this up. And then right. nobody ever thinks of the holding costs. I mean, holding costs add up hugely when doing a fix and flip, especially. Mm. So you got your, most people are using private money of some sort or hard money of some sort. Um, if you're lucky enough to be able to use just conventional financing, that's awesome. Um, and, and your money's going to be a lot less, but most people are going to be paying, you know, a point or two up front, 12% right. interest, let's just say, um, utility costs, taxes, um, insurance costs. So all that really adds up. And, you know, if you don't have that included in your budget, you're going to really shoot yourself in the foot overall. Yeah. So two big things there, it sounds like, right? So understanding what things cost, materials, but also the pe things people don't always look at, which are going to be your holding costs. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Then also understanding your market is mm -hmm. going to be important too. What do you think... Obviously, going out and acquiring knowledge is a big piece of what you do. Where's a good place to start, right? There's because there's so much stuff that you can learn or you should learn. Do you recommend mm -hmm. people start, you know, understanding their local market, maybe understanding uh, material costs, starting to get kind of their hands dirty in that area of things? Like, is there a specific place you think is best to start when it comes to acquiring the knowledge you need? Yeah, because to be honest, I think that goes back to, again, kind of what we touched on in the beginning is what are you looking to do in real estate? I think that's kind of the first thing. If you came up to me, RJ, as a uh, knew nothing about real estate investing, mm -hmm. and you came to me and you said, hey, I want to be a real estate investor. How do I start? I would say, well, what are you trying to accomplish with being a real estate investor? Is it you need money right now? Is it you have a specific skill set that you want to be making more money than a you know, normal day job at? Is it um, trying to fix up your family for the future? Are you trying to buy houses that are going to be able to provide income for your family in the future or maybe pay for your kid's college in the future? Um, what is it that you're really trying to accomplish with this? Because if you don't have that kind of your why, you know, everyone talks about their why sure. yeah, or why, yeah. they, why they work, right? Um, I think same exact thing goes into real estate investing. Why are you investing in real estate? What's your purpose on investing in real estate? 
So um, if you came to me, that'd be the very first thing I ask you, well, what are you trying to accomplish with this? Is it, you know, and then you would answer that. So based on that, yeah. you know, you could kind of go a few different ways. If it's fix and flips, it's got to be, you got to know hard money inside and out. You got to have all your people lined up from the very beginning. Um, you have to know material costs. You know how to know processes. You know, how is the process of taking something down to the studs and rebuilding it go? You're not going to put, you're not going to tear something out and then put brand new floors in, right? Because they're just going right. to get destroyed before <laughs> the project's right. over. So right, you right, kind of right. kind of have to know order of operations, um, money, and then you have to have your people ready and it has to be very budgeted out. Um, and people, if you, if people's going to be like your, your contractors, right? Is that yes, your yes, subcontractors? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Your, your sphere of influence when it comes your, your, your crew, basically. Um, Plumbers, electricians. Is, yeah. Yep. Yep. Time is a hundred percent money when it comes to fix and flips. You make, you really make your money on the buy when it comes to uh, a fix and flip and you have to have all that things ready. Whereas a buy and hold is much different. Um, understanding financing, understanding how to get the property, understanding the tax advantages, understanding, um, you know, leveraging that money into other things. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a lot different ball game when you talk about buy and holds. And yeah. my always my goal when trying to buy real estate from an early age was I'm going to do some fix and flips to be able to get the cash necessary to buy and hold. So the goal for me always was I'm going to do fix and flips just because that's new, you know, what I knew. Um, and then using that money to later on be able to do buy and holds was always the goal for me. Yeah, that's awesome. One question on the buy and hold piece is always around the management of the property. Do mm -hmm. you, or do you have any recommendation in terms of having a property manager or managing it yourself, any tools that you use or kind of thoughts around that piece of it? Cause I think that's maybe another thing that people don't think through, right? Where you don't yep. really realize yep. your holding costs on a fix and flip and maybe you don't really understand the work that goes into actually managing a property, collecting rent, getting a tenant in, you know, fixing the water mm -hmm. heater when it breaks on Thanksgiving. Yeah. Understanding the city codes. I think that's a big thing now too. Oh, sure. Um, understanding. I, and that's huge here in Bellingham for us is just knowing what the city expects when you own a rental. Um, so yeah, my thought would be if you are a W2 employee and you're just trying to buy and hold and you have a, your normal job that you're well, you know, and you do well in and you like, let's just say, and this mm -hmm. is just kind of something that you're going to be leveraging for the future. I would 100% tell everybody to just buy it or get a property manager. There's there's no reason for you to be trying to manage that yourself. I think you're going to run into more headaches, more issues than anything else if you're doing mm -hmm. that. Whereas um, if you're a already a real estate broker, let's just say like me, or even a lender, honestly, and you're self-employed, um, you're already in that realm of the world. Um, I think it's kind of advantageous actually to do some of the management yourself um some people aren't going to be as comfortable doing that but um sure. I, i've actually kind of somewhat enjoyed doing parts of it um there's always that call at one in the morning that a hot water tank <laughs> blew up or something yeah so you're yeah, gonna yeah, yeah. you're gonna run into that but um i you know overall it can be advantageous for you to to do that yourself um and, and there's so many, i mean you can go through so many different tools there's you know a million different things online um, even zillow has a full setup where you can get a tenant in, use their leases collect oh, nice. even through them so there, there's a lot of different programs out there this is kind of finding the one that fits you and what you like on that side of things um but yeah that's kind of what i would say is kind of depends on the person again that's kind of one thing i mean just overall that you've kind of mm -hmm. noticed in this is that's why i like real estate investing in general it's not a one-size-fits-all it's not a stock that you buy and just sit on and have no control over whatsoever. Um, real estate is so customizable that it's pretty fun. You know, no, no deal is going to be the exact same. No situation is going to yep. be the same. Um, so that's kind of what makes it fun is it's not just buy something. I have no control over it. Hopefully it goes up mm -hmm. or I see these trends that are going up. It's more, yeah. you know, you can actually do things to the property to make it go up. You can affect the value of it. And overall, you, you do know if it goes down in the short term, it's going to go up overall in the long term. So sure. just, just hold on. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One thought I have, too, is, you know, you had your dad. Uh, have you found any 
is there like any groups or anything that you found effective in terms of investment minded individuals? And like, if somebody was looking for even a mentor, are there places mm -hmm. that they can go when they're trying to get into investing? Yeah. So there's, there's local RIAs that you can join. Um, Bellingham itself is a little light on that kind of thing. But if you're out mm -hmm. there, like, let's just say you're in Seattle, there's a huge area group in there. There's actually multiple different area groups um, that you can join. That's how I first got started was I just went to a local meetings and, you know, there'd be, mm -hmm. let's just say 30 other investors there trying to do things. A few of them brand new, a few of them have five rentals and a few of them, oh, I have 35, 40 rentals um, or I do huge fix and flips. So you kind of get to know a few people and typically if you're joining those kind of groups, you're going to kind of gravitate towards a couple different people and everyone's typically pretty nice with that. So early on, other than my dad, you know, I was talking to a couple other local people here that I still are in friends with today. And, yeah. you know, they're nice enough to share some of their knowledge. And, you know, at this point now it's kind of like a powwow of, Oh, what's working for you? What's working for me? Sure, kind of yeah. Collaborate a little bit on that. So it's, it's a yeah. lot more fun when you can collaborate and share stories and get tips and tricks from other people um, overall than just doing it by yourself. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Huge resource being able to learn from other people. So that's good. Yeah. And other honestly, than having... I, would, I would push people to bigger pockets again too. Yeah. Bigger pockets has got a great community on there. Yeah. Good community. Maybe just um, like with anything, just have the right perspective is kind of what I heard you say before, yep. right? Have the right perspective when you approach something like that, because people are going to be in much different markets. So it goes back to take, yeah. taking the knowledge, but also yeah, very much understand right. your market because what works in, you know, Missouri doesn't necessarily work in the Pacific Northwest Absolutely. or even the West coast. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Know your market. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Know your market. Yeah. Uh, that's good, man. I appreciate that. I don't know. I mean, other than, Hey, if there's any 13 year olds out there, read rich dad, poor dad. <laughs> there you go. That's so cool. I, actually I love that have, you read uh, that. You need to get oh, that into yeah. the schools. I, I, I agree. Um, I do have a little tip as well for other people is um, I, I think one big thing, especially in today's market is stick with your, your plan too. So um, like when I started and started buying investment properties, I was sending out letters to marketed uh, places. So mm -hmm. let's say I wanted to buy, let's just say as an example, a core, core neighborhood duplex in Bell Bellingham. You can go to the title yeah. company and ask for a list with your qualifications and you'll get 1800 addresses and names. And, um, I just start writing letters. So I would yeah. do that. I would send out a hundred every other week. And I did that for probably five, six years. And kind of a cool story on that is I did that for quite a few years. Um, very consistently. I, I actually ended up hiring my sister who was in college at the time and she would just charge me for per 100 she would charge me i can't even remember how much it was to just write out all the letters send them you know and you know everything and so she was just on a schedule of every other week doing that um and you have to stay consistent with it. if you do one mailer you're not going to get anything or you might get one right. angry person call you but if you stay consistent over time it's going to work and you're going to actually get some real opportunities from that um and a great example of that is i did that and i stopped for a while because i was bus busy building my real estate brokerage business side mm -hmm. of thing and all of a sudden i got a call one day and it was a lady and she called me and said hey i got your letter um that you're interested in buying this property i'm kind of considering selling it and i asked her more qualifying questions you know you have to be personable in real estate don't be don't be a jerk don't be, you know anything <laughs> like that right. just right. be a decent human um, you know, to ask your questions and it turns out it was a very big building she was trying to sell. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, to be honest, um, where I'm at in life, I'm trying to really just buy a duplex right now. She goes, oh, well, funny enough, I'm actually out of duplex right now. Haven't thought about selling it, but maybe I would. Um, I'm cleaning out one of the units right now. If you want to come take a look, I go meet her <laughs> over there. Um, it's so literally, cool. it's in Barkley. It's a perfect little duplex. Um, exactly what I was looking for. And it, it ends up being where we work out a deal. We literally write on a yellow notepad yes. out a deal structure from there. Yeah. And we end up, I you know take that, turn it into a contract. Um, we even did an owner contract on that. And we closed probably 45 days later. And so I think, and I eventually asked her like, when was the letter I wrote you? Like, I honestly don't remember when I possibly yeah. would have sent that. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, I, I got it 
probably four years ago and I just put it in a folder just in case I did ever want to sell the building, I could have some people yes. call. And so that's Come just on. a great example of awesome. Like I wrote a letter four yeah. years ago that translated into something years later. Yeah. So, Do the things and cool be consistent. Story. Yep. Be consistent. That's, that's awesome, man. That's so cool. I appreciate that. We'll, we can yeah. wrap it on that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs>